So, so, so we need to change. We need to. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Let me go back to that bit because I just want. Uh, oh no, it's going to go through all those again. Sorry about this. Anyway, I'll talk for a few minutes while it's. Oh no. Okay. Right. Okay. So, so now let's look. Let's look instead about where somebody should get their hearing tested. What we should do is do it routinely throughout life because as soon as we do that, what we do is that, tri that triangle that represents the population of, the, um, of our countries again, what we're saying is it now becomes relevant to everyone. So if people are only coming through our doors because they want hearing aids, we're not relevant to anyone unless they consider hearing aids to be relevant and we've been telling them they're not for years. But instead, if we're saying we will keep, we will keep your hearing working at its best, we suddenly become relevant to everyone, the whole population. So we're, send we're getting people to follow the crowd. Um, you, you get people then that will come in and sort of say, well, my son had a hearing test, or my neighbor had a hearing test, and they had good hearing. So I'm having a hearing test because everybody seems to be getting hearing tests. You don't do this overnight. You have to build to it. So it establishes a social norm so that people who don't have their hearing tested is now a problem. Just as it happens with routine eye checks, routine dental checks. And so what as well is that because you're checking their hearing as they go along, that, um, it means that you can detect those changes before they would actually notice them themselves, which means that you lower the threshold of noticeability. Because if you point out in the chart you are missing some of the Fs and the Ss and the, and the first sounds, then when they go into those conversations, it's like, oh, yeah, right, this isn't because of the situation. This is because I'm missing those sounds. Yeah, I, I hate this. I hate missing those sounds. I'm going to do what I can to bring those back in. In fact, I found that when you take this approach, what happens is people come to you and they say, okay, so I'm missing those things, so what do I need to do? And it's not like you telling them they need to do it and then counseling them to accept it. They're actually saying, well, what's the solution? It, it switches the whole thing around. Because it's suddenly it becomes an avoidance of loss. They don't want to miss the best conversation of their life. They want to keep their hearing working at its best because when their hearing's at its best, they're at their best. Ah, I shouldn't say that. Okay, so let's come back to this, this triangle, because what we want to do now is, now that we've looked at some of this, we want to bring it all together into a systematic framework that we can use to shape people's attitudes. Because what we really want to do is we want to have the tools that we can, we can go back to our practices as instruments of change. So remembering what we're saying about irrelevance and relevance. So as people go up higher up the triangle, it becomes more relevant to them. As it becomes more relevant, they'll be using less and less ready-made attitudes. And our goal here is to try and get people to be, uh, get hearing aids to be more relevant to them. So at the point where, where, to the point where they will commit to using hearing aids, if that's what they need. And so we work on this. Remember that the three people that we currently leave behind do not consider hearing aids to be relevant to them, or they've picked up the wrong signals. And so what we, what we need to do is work in, in, on a three-stage three process. The first thing is we need to create exposure. And, and what we're trying to do here is cast our net as wide as possible so that we are establishing a social norm. And there are certain things that we want to put into that social norm, which we've already touched on, but I'll reinforce it in the next slide. The second stage is that... Um, so creating exposure, by the way, isn't just for those people, the three people that we currently leave behind. It's for society. It basically tells them how should they approach, be approaching their hearing. And they rely on us as experts to tell them that. Building encounters. This is the opportunities that people have to encounter our practices, to encounter hearing technology. Now, at the moment, if, if the only reason that people encounter our, our, our practices is because they need hearing protection, well, that excludes a lot of people from the population. Um, potentially, it could bring in more people, but that's a to totally different message, and we need to work on that too. But if it's only for hearing aids, then we're excluding 97% of the population straight away. The third thing is that we've got to ease engagement. We've got to make it as easy as possible. So when they reach that point of commitment, we've smoothed the journey for them. A little bit like if you go, if, if you, if you go on holiday um, abroad or something, and you have to take a long flight, as, as, as many of us did to come here, you're not thinking about that plane flight. That's the journey to get you there. What you're really thinking about is the destination. So we have to keep people focused on the destination, which is their hearing, and make it as easy as possible for them to get them using hearing technology successfully. So if we look at the third, uh, we're almost finished. If we look at, the, um, if we look at um, the create exposure, that first thing, when does somebody get their hearing checked? What would you say now? Routinely throughout life. How does somebody notice a change in their hearing? What would you tell people? The, the, the point is you can't. So we tell people that. 
that sort of say, you can't tell if you're hearing well or not. The only way you can know is if somebody else tells you, for one thing, but we never listen to anybody else when it comes to ourselves, but with routine hearing checks. So it means that if you're not having a routine hearing check, then the chances are you could have a, a problem with your hearing, and everybody else knows, but you don't. And that puts people on the back foot then, because we want to avoid social isolation. We don't want the group to think badly of us. Who uses hearing technology? Is it the deaf and hard of hearing? No, it's potentially everyone who appears to be hearing well. Now, this, 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 is, this is really, actually, a really powerful way forward for us. Because the thing is, if you remember, we said that only 3% of the population use hearing technology. It's not relevant to most people. So if you use it, you are now one of the ones with the condition. But if we change that and we sort of say, and we don't tell people they're embarrassed, you know, the, the fact that they're small is because you're embarrassed about your hearing. What we say is, these things are so discreet that you never know when, you, when you'll encounter somebody who could be using hearing technology. In fact, the fact that they're hearing well probably means that they could be using hearing technology. Now, we don't have to say it in so many words, but we create that, that supposition that that could be happening. Because that is actually the truth. If you had two people in background noise, one with good hearing and one with good hearing because, of the, because it was augmented with hearing technology, so they were in an enhanced human being, sounds very matrixy, doesn't it? If, if they were in that position, then, then you wouldn't know if they were using hearing technology or not. So that means that potentially anybody out there could be using hearing technology. And if you're not hearing well, it's because you're not using hearing technology, whereas everyone else is. Can you see, we switch around the social norm, and we can do this through our messages and through adverts. We don't have to say it, we simply imply it with, with a tool called presupposition, which I don't have time to go into today. When should I use hearing technology? Not when your hearing is bad enough. No, that's the wrong message because people say, my hearing's not bad enough for all the associations in the background. What we say is to be yourself whenever the situation demands it. So we put the focus onto the situation, which is essentially what we do when we're counseling people. We use things like cozy, don't we? We're, we're sort of saying, right, what situations do you want to improve? But in our messages out there, when we're creating exposure at the moment, we don't have those messages. And so we need to bring that outside. It's, it's all very well people coming through and we being the best counselors in the world, but if they haven't come through our doors in the first place, we still leave, leave another three people behind. So this, this is an advert we ran. Eyes checked, teeth checked, hearing checked. And here, what we're saying is, okay, most people at the moment, most people don't get their hearing checked at the moment. They don't get it routinely checked. So we need, to, we need to give them another social norm that they can follow. And the social norm is that they get their eyes checked and their teeth checked. So it makes sense to have their hearing checked. And it reinforces it. So this is a sticky message. It's easy to remember and easy to apply um, because we're building on the three monkeys, as you can see. Now, um, what we have found is that when people come through our doors, if we've been running adverts like this, people come in and sort of say, well, we get our eyes checked and our teeth checked, don't we? And they're actually repeating it back to me. They don't know where they came up with that idea, but it came from somewhere. And I know that before I put those, those adverts out, nobody was talking about it. Also, can you see as well the little tagline there? We can all tell who doesn't get their hearing checked, can't we? Because we all know people who don't hear well, but we don't recognize it ourselves. So now we create the suspicion that maybe we're not hearing as well, but we wouldn't know, but everyone else does. It makes you feel as though you should be catching it before somebody else catches it. This is, what, this is the, type of, the, the type of thing that we run to do with hearing technology. Again, what we're trying to do is here is build positive associations through classical conditioning. So because every moment counts, th th those aren't really he hearing aids, by the way. I didn't want to use anybody's and they get into trouble for saying we don't want our products to be associated with this imagery. So, so, th so here you see happy people. You see people of different ages. You see them in, in a situation where, where people want to hear well. And you don't know who's wearing the hearing technology. We're not making a big thing of it. But we're also placing it on the fact that it is that moment and it enables you to be in that moment because your hearing is working as, as, as it should. And people are associating the technology not with the condition, but with how people want to see themselves. Oh, yeah, we, we're also transferring some emotion there because when we look at happiness, it transfers to us too, which is why we catch smiles generally. Sounds like an illness. Right. We're, we build encounters. When we're building encounters, as I said before, we have to be relevant. So for the three people we leave behind, we want to give people reasons to come in, with routine hearing checks. We want to say approach with our language, not avoid. So we need to make sure our messages, go home, rewrite your website, go home, rewrite your brochures, 
I'm kind of half serious here. And just, just say, every t everywhere you see the word hearing loss, see if you can use the word hearing range and change the wording around to make that work. Give the, make sure that the things you want them to avoid are the things that you want them to avoid, not what they think they should be avoiding. So speak in terms of the hearing and not in terms of the, condi um, in the condition. And finally, we need to make it as easy as possible. So as I said before, when can these people see me if they're working all the time? Because this is my biggest target audience now. And what do they expect when they're doing business with me? They don't expect to... In the past, people used to save all their money um, after the war, for example, and then they used to spend it... Then they used to have all these savings that they could use for investing in their hearing. People of working age tend not to think like that. What models are they using for mobile phones? What models are they using from cars? What models are they using from computers? We need to build that into the way that we do business. Things have changed. So create exposure, build encounters, ease engagements. That's how we reach the three people we, we leave behind. Because for too long, we've, we've seen ourselves as the people who pick up the pieces of broken hearing. And we need to now see ourselves as the guardians of people's hearing. To the, the people who equip and empower individuals and society to keep its hearing working at its best. Because they look to us for the lead, because we are the experts. We shouldn't be taking our lead from them and then trying to respond and mend those pieces. We should be saying, this is how you approach your hearing. And so, so, so we need to put our focus back onto hearing. And, and, and we need to guide society. And, and this is going to take some changes. And the thing is that we're going to face people that, that will try to keep the status quo. And we're going to face those who, who, want to, who want to throw us off our course or, or that don't understand what we're doing. But it's really important that we understand that they will not realize what they're up against. Because by doing these, we can become instruments of change. Thank you.